Hi, I'm Amanda Anderson, Digital Media Specialist at Pioneer PBS. We're replacing tonight's regularly scheduled Compass episode with a special to provide information about how the novel coronavirus is impacting our farming and agriculture communities. You can watch all episodes of Compass, including the one originally scheduled for tonight anytime online at pioneer.org slash compass or on the free PBS video app. Hopefully by now we've all heard the recommendations to wash our hands and practice social distancing to hashtag flatten the curve. So when we were discussing what Pioneer PBS could add to the conversation about the novel coronavirus, we wanted to be additive and relevant to our viewers. Farming and agriculture is the backbone of many of our communities and we felt that these topics were missing from the reporting. Earlier this week, I had a socially distant conversation with Minnesota Department of Agriculture Commissioner Tom Peterson and Chippewa County Farmer and Pioneer PBS Board Chair Mark Olson. We talked about trading predictions, direct marketing, ethanol-based hand sanitizers, and what kind of aid will be available for farmers. Thank you so much, both of you, for being here. Mark Olson is a corn, soybean, and sugar beet farmer and Tom Peterson is the Commissioner of the Department of Agriculture, and I thank you for joining us today. Coming on the heels of the trade war, how are you anticipating coronavirus-related issues might impact farming imports and exports, and what kind of um, aid might farmers see from either federal stimulus packages, I know one's being worked on, or state yeah. aid. I think there's a lot of opportunities for trade, but it's really going to depend on keeping that supply chain open is uh, going to be really critical the next couple of weeks. So keeping people as healthy as possible. Um, you know, I think that we'll continue to see opportunities in China. We're uh, continuing to move forward with USMCA, um, but we need to keep people healthy. We need to keep the supply chains open. Uh, as far as aid goes, I think that there's a lot of talk about having another uh, package from the federal government or a third round of payments, but we'll have to see how that plays out as well. But I know our congressional delegation is working on that as well. Do you know, do you have any kind of like timeline of when that might, it's just all so unpredictable, I know, but. No, I really don't have any uh, timeline at that. We're taking steps too at the state level to make sure we have some resources available, kind of thinking down the line maybe later this summer. The one thing the legislature did is they went out the door, they passed a $50 million for our Rural Finance Authority um, that we make loans uh, to farmers. And so that's good. We continue to do that and operate with that. But we're looking down the road to as what farmers may need as we come out of this. So even though there are travel restrictions to a number of countries, including China, you're not the import, importing and exporting is a thing that isn't, hasn't been impacted by that yet, really? For, for example, Canada um, has placed restrictions on travel, and Canada is our number one trading partner, and, and uh, the borders open for uh, agricultural products to flow back and forth uh, to Canada and Mexico as we speak. Um, that could change, potentially, but right now we are continuing to move our agricultural products. Since it started, we've seen... Uh... The corn price dropped about 50 cents and the soybeans have dropped about 80 cents. And, um, you know, some of that market uh, will take a long time to try and recover. Uh, some of the uh, ethanol business also has been hurt with the uh, the petroleum wars with uh, uh, Russia and um, the uh, Arab countries. So um, uh, some of that's really hurt the ethanol uh, producers. Absolutely. That's a great point. I read in Political, Politico's morning agriculture newsletter that the agriculture department is rolling out plans to help rural areas affected by the virus. So things like private partnerships to deliver meals to students and that also farm credit officials asked ag lenders to work with borrowers who are experiencing coronavirus related economic hardships. Can you talk about how Minnesotans might be seeing those sorts of benefits? Our uh, schools right now are delivering uh, meals and, and we're making that a top priority. We're really working at the Department of Agriculture to make sure we can keep the uh, our food shelves uh, stocked and keep the process moving. One of the issues we have is volunteers at food shelves and food banks. The average age of a volunteer at a food shelf is almost uh, in the late 70s. And so those are people that we don't necessarily want out and about right now. 
And so that's uh, making a challenge. We really appreciate that Minnesota companies are stepping up, are keeping uh, their processes moving. Um, but there are a lot of different pieces uh, uh, with that right now. So at the state level, we're working, um, you know, those are that's our top priority right now, too, is the food shelves, the food banks. You probably saw the governor made grocery store workers essential, uh, but just making sure we can get that food to people who need it. Mark, maybe could related to the lending aid, lending um, part of that question. Do you have any comment on that at all? Well, I think that, you know, there, this is a time of year when uh, everybody's lining up their operating loans for the year. And, you know, and if uh, people don't have them in place right now, that's going to be a critical uh, need to meet with their lenders to try and get the financing in place to uh, get the next year's uh, operating notes uh, so they can buy their fertilizer, seed, and chemical uh, and everything they need to uh, go forward. Now, a lot of the co-ops have uh, restricted um, access to the, uh, the offices and, and have eliminated some of their uh, pathogen meetings and co-op meetings. Uh, so they're trying to do it uh, over the phone or uh, through email and uh, trying to do things as remotely as possible. So um, uh, a lot of that might be a challenge for a lot of farmers that aren't very tech savvy. So um, that's going to be important to go forward. Yeah. So before you join the call, Tom, Mark and I were talking about, I was just wondering if what he had been seeing personally impacts related to coronavirus and social distancing and self-quarantining. And he was talking about, yeah, the, this face-to-face -face meeting time when his seed sellers or seed dealers would be coming to meet with him. It's just not happening right now. Yeah, for yeah. anybody that hasn't, hasn't uh, gotten their uh, inputs uh, lined up, uh, this was a time when uh, salesmen would normally make calls on, uh, on customers to try and uh, tie up some of the loose ends and stuff. And uh, a lot of the co-ops or the uh, dealers aren't sending people out to make those calls. Right, exactly what we're seeing and really appreciate all the steps our Minnesota companies are taking. I'm on the phone a lot with a lot of our different uh, production facilities and companies and important they're taking those steps but also looking at being creative on how they can help the farmers get their crop put in the field this year. Do you have any examples of creative steps people are taking? Yeah <clears throat> I think that you know we talked with uh, ethanol um, you know uh, different things there too where um, uh, ethanol we're looking at using some of the alcohol for uh, hand sanitizers but then also the contact uh, parts pickups, for example, for farmers who uh, are getting all their equipment ready, spending a lot of time in their shops right now, making sure everything's ready. So uh, curbside pickup for uh, parts is one thing I heard is really interesting. So I think the thing you brought up, Mark, about farmers who might not be as tech savvy needing to work in this new world. Do you have any examples of things you're seeing people do differently or maybe things you've had to do differently in using tech? Well, this this is one of them. I don't think I've seen it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and especially when it comes to uh, getting uh, your financial records together and getting them to your, uh, to your uh, lender, um, you know, some of that used to be done on a more uh, individual basis that, you know, maybe they're trying to uh, eliminate some of that contact. Tom, are you anticipating any sort of workforce shortage? That's a great question. Um, we already have a shortage of workers, so this is going to kind of compound the system uh, or the problem. And so we are working very closely with our congressional delegation on, for example, H-2A workers are seasonal workers that a lot of our fruit vegetable growers use, um, and they're uh, coming now. And so that uh, as uh, restrictions are placed on that, that's a real uh, big issue. We need those uh, that workforce. Um, and so we're also looking at are there ways where people are laid off or working at home, uh, you know, and their um, opportunities there may be available as well. So this uh, workforce in, uh, for farms will be an issue, especially for some of our bigger fruit vegetable growers in our um, uh, farms that milk cows, things like that. I'm wondering if you have examples of um, unique collaborations or things that you're hearing, positive stories that you're hearing from the farming and ag community? Yeah, I, th I think what's just really um, important is just that um, 
the uh, um, that that we're our top priority is to make sure we have a safe, affordable, and accessible food supply. And right now, everything is running very smoothly. Um, that uh, we've taken a lot of steps, but there will be uh, slowdowns. So there will be things. Uh, um, that will come up. Um, and I would say like the things that I think are unique are the local and direct marketing has really taken off. A lot of those people are really uh, uh, telling me they're selling a lot of product. For example, this weekend I brought I bought chicken uh, directly from a farmer uh, who delivered it to my doorstep. I bought pork from a farmer uh, who I went and picked up from one of their uh, spots. And so there's a lot of uh, that too as well that farmers are... Um, uh, can, can benefit from. And then keep in mind, we recognize farmers will be essential uh, in any kind of uh, um, stop movement or slowdowns that farmers, uh, cows need to be milked, uh, cattle need to be fed, our crops going to need to be get planted and put it in the ground. And so a lot of important steps that we're taking. So I encourage people, uh, Minnesota Grown is our, uh, is our piece, but to go to our website, um, uh, Minnesota Department of Agriculture, and right on the front page, we have a lot of information on COVID-19 and how it re reacts to uh, farmers, uh, food supply, um, food retailers, uh, just about uh, Board of Animal Health, uh, questions with livestock. So I really encourage people to check out our website right on the front page uh, to, at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. Yeah, okay, well, I'll let you go. Thank you so much yeah. for your time. I know you're busy. Thanks, and guys. I, I really appreciate, appreciate it. it. Yeah. Yep. Bye. Bye. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Since my interview with Commissioner Tom Peterson, officials representing the Trump administration and top Democrats finalized an agreement on a roughly $2 trillion stimulus package to confront the coronavirus pandemic. This is the largest economic stimulus measure in modern history. While the details aren't readily available as of this recording, the Washington Post reported that, quote, final issues included a push by Democrats for a dramatic increase in food stamp benefits in exchange for accepting billions more in funding for the administration's farm bailout that Republicans have included in the stimulus bill. Senator John Hoven said in a news release that the legislation would increase the amount the Agriculture Department can spend on its bailout program from $30 billion to $50 billion.